a little caveat about, caveat about this talk is that it's, it's very much applied. I'm actually a physicist by training, so the mathematics in it will be super light, but hopefully it will be enough to sort of keep you all interested. So this is work that I was doing towards the end of my PhD with my supervisor, Richard, Richard Craster, and it's all, it's all basically about waves in elastic materials. Um, so with that, I will give a little outline and you might be a little bit surprised that actually the first couple of slides aren't going to be about metamaterials, nor are they going to be about elasticity. So please bear with me, you are still in, in the correct talk. So I'm going to give a little bit of a historical background about metamaterials and what they are, but from the context of electromagnetism, which is sort of the field I, I came from. And then throughout my PhD, I got quite quickly involved in elasticity. So then I'll hopefully be able to convince you that we have some some cool little devices that can control elastic waves for a variety of purposes. So basically the things that I'm interested in are surface waves. So these are waves which propagate along an interface and in electromagnetism, these are called uh, surface plasmon polaritons and they exist at the boundary between a conductor and an insulator. So metal and air or something like this. And they exist over um, a particular range of frequencies and are characterized by something called the dispersion relation. So this is something that I'm going to focus quite a lot on. So I just want to take a little bit of time to uh, explain this plot. I'm not sure, can you see this laser pointer that's on the screen actually? Uh, yes, we can. Fabulous, okay. So basically what the dispersion relation does is it gives you the relationship between the frequency to the wave number. So if you take a horizontal line at a given frequency, if I cut one of these blue curves here, then I have a solution to the wave equation which corresponds to a propagating wave. And that's basically what I'm interested in, waves that propagate and exponentially decay from some interface. So if I was to excite in between these two blue bands, and this is what's known as a band gap, and you wouldn't get any solutions that correspond to a constant amplitude, you ex basically excite an exponentially decaying wave. So we're not interested in something like them. And I want to draw your attention to this black line here, which is called the light line. So that is the dispersion line for free waves in a vacuum or wherever in electromagnetism. And the thing that the dispersion relation gives you is not only it tells you what frequencies are supported by your medium, but it also gives you the speed because when you take the derivative of the frequency with respect to the wave number, you get the group velocity of your waves. So free um, electromagnetic waves have this straight line. So they have a constant speed with frequency. But over some frequency ranges, you see that we have this curve on the bottom here, and that actually disperses. So it's now no longer a straight line. So you've changed the speed of your waves with frequency. And that's something interesting about these surface plasma and polaritons is they're actually slower than light in free space. So this sounds all very well and good, but actually about 20 years ago, people were realizing that actually these um, surface plasmas, they only exist sort of in the optical regime and actually back um, in the early 2000s, people were looking at, can we use these in the microwave regimes for a variety of different applications? But in the microwave regime, metals behave like perfect conductors. So basically they don't support these modes. They just screen all the electromagnetic radiation off them. So the main idea behind metamaterials then is can we do something to the surface so that we can alter the dispersion? And that's basically what this whole talk is gonna be about, is about manipulating the dispersion relation to control surface waves. So. Um, in 2004, John Pendry, who's sort of seen as the godfather of um, metamaterials here at Imperial, he created this thing called the Pendry Hole Array, where he basically took a perfect electrical conductor, so it was like a slab of silver, and they drilled holes in it. And these holes were sub-wavelength and just a periodic square array. And what that did was it basically tricked the material into thinking that it can support a surface plasmon and that this um, dispersion relation here, you could now tailor it. So you could tune the frequencies and get down into the microwave regime. So by adding some structuring, we gave the material a property that it didn't have without the structuring. And that's kind of a very general definition of what a metamaterial is. It's an artificial man-made composite structure that allows um, some behavior that wouldn't naturally occur. So this has been a super duper quick overview of MET materials. So the year later, um, some colleagues in Exeter actually experimentally verified this. So these two pictures here show what happens without the meta surface or the meta structure that the um, there's no bound surface wave here. It's just the wave just extends off. But as soon as you start drilling these holes, you get this exponentially localized um, wave profile on either side of um, the interface. And this had a lot of um, applications in the microwave regime. And now what I want to hopefully 
convince you is that we can actually borrow some of these concepts in the elastic regime. Um, so now that you've had a whistle-stop tour of metamaterials and elastic in electromagnetism, I will now give you an even quicker whistle-stop tour of elasticity. And because we're in a mathematics conference, I thought I should probably show you some equations at least. So this is the equation of motion for a linear elastic material. We don't really need to know too much about it other than U is the displacement field of our solids and mu and lambda are what's called the Lam Lamy elastic moduli. So they just encode the type of material that, that we're looking at. All this stuff is sort of tied together with the constitutive relations which um, relate the stress and the strain in the material to the displacement. That's just sort of details which, as I said, I'm gonna be really light on the mathematics. And really what I want to show you that elasticity diverges quite quickly from electromagnetism. And you can see this when you split up your displacement field into a longitudinal and a transverse component. If you substitute this back into your equation of motion, what you end up with is two wave equations. So there are two types of waves in an elastic body. And the main difference between this and electromagnetism is that these uh, wave equations travel with different speeds. And these correspond to compressional P waves and shear S waves. So the compressional P waves is like a classical acoustic sound wave. It's a pressure wave where the particle motion is parallel to the direction of propagation. Whereas the S wave, it's, it's transverse to the direction of propagation. And P waves travel faster than shear waves. And more complications in elasticity is that these guys actually couple at interfaces and defects within your solid. So if you hit a, a, a scatterer with a compressional wave, you'll also get some reflected and scattered S waves and vice versa. But as I said at the start, I'm actually really, I, I really care about surface waves. And this is another complication of elasticity that at, surface, at uh, surfaces and interfaces, there exist uh, exponentially localized Rayleigh waves. And both the compressional and shear waves couple to this at interfaces as well. And this is what I'm super interested in really is uh, surface um, Rayleigh waves. And this is why I gave the sort of analogy to the electromagnetic uh, case at the start in that these are sort of the closest analogy to a surface plasmon in, in elasticity. And so if you look at the dispersion relation for um, compressional shear and Rayleigh waves, you see that like the light line we had for free electromagnetic waves, they are dispersionless. So they have straight lines, so their speed does not change with frequency. And you see that the Rayleigh wave has the slowest group velocity because it's got the, the less steep slope. And so what I want to hopefully convince you is that we can borrow concepts from metamaterials to alter the dispersion of these Rayleigh waves. So that's the sort of goal that I want to convince you that we can do this. And then you might ask yourself, well, why on earth would you want to do this in the first place? Well, I would argue that elasticity and uh, vibrations are pretty ubiquitous and they happen across a massive range of scales. So Rayleigh waves have uses in ultrasonic inspection for detecting cracks and structural integrity. So quite engineering applications. And um, if you live next to a train line, you'll know that it's quite annoying when a train goes past, you can feel buildings shaking and a lot of this is caused by ground vibration. They carry energy, so potentially if there's stray Rayleigh waves in our environment, could we siphon off or scaven energy from them? They're also used all the time in surface acoustic wave devices, which there are thousands of in your mobile phone. And at the much larger scale, um, they are present in seismic events. So actually in earthquakes, slow moving Rayleigh waves are the waves that do the most damage to man-made structures such as buildings and cause them to, to sway and rock because of their um, polarization. So what I want to convince you is that hopefully we will be able to manipulate these waves. So like in the electromagnetic case, we're gonna do something to this, surfer, this surface to see if we can alter the dispersion. But rather than drilling holes in it, such in the electromagnetic case, we are gonna look at a periodic array of rods or resonant rods. So here we have our elastic half space, and we're just going to glue on some resonant rods that can bounce up and down. They can also flex your left to right and twist, but we only care about this up and down motion. And the sort of motivation to do this is that, particularly when you are studying periodic systems from a, the point of view of solid state, it's, they're really handy because the systems are much easier to solve mathematically, and they also define, define dispersion relations which are related to the resonator itself, so the rod, but also to do with the, the spacing in which we, we, um, we separate them with. And so most of the mathematics actually behind this talk comes from generating these dispersion curves, but as I said, I won't really go into the details, but hopefully that I can convince you that if you look at the dispersion curves for these rods, 
then we recover something that looks like, again, the, the surface plasmon in, in electromagnetism and that we have this band gap where at some asymptotic frequency, we now come off the light line or, or the sound line of, of the Rayleigh wave and we get this slow moving branch. So let's see what actually happens if, if we have these rods. So if we look at two cases and we excite at a frequency that's in the band gap, remember what I said that that doesn't correspond to any propagating modes in our structure. So that's at um, this frequency here. We have a Rayleigh wave that comes in from the right. And you see that as soon as it hits our periodic crystal of rods, it exponentially decays and we have no propagating Rayleigh wave in this, this array. So if we put something behind this array, it wouldn't see this potentially annoying um, Rayleigh wave. And also then if we excite at a slightly lower frequency, we see that because we've introduced dispersion, we change the speed of the Rayleigh wave and we see that the wavelength um, changes as this wave comes into our structure. It's now supported by the structure, but we've slowed it down. So we can either block waves entering um, a periodic crystal or we can slow them down. So this is the sort of two things that we have to play with. So you might think, well, that's, that's the question answered. We now are gonna get no Rayleigh waves and that's fine. But the problem with this is that this is quite a pitifully small band gap. So these effects only happen over a very narrow frequency range. And if we're wanting to use this in our environment where we have lots of different frequencies present, then perhaps we want to um, sort of make our meta surface a bit more complicated. So that's, that's the main question. Can we do any better? And we have this trick, um, which is to introduce a gentle or adiabatic grading of each rod. So instead of having rods of all the same height, we introduce some slope. And what this does is that if you do it gently enough, you trick the wave to think that it now has a spatially dependent dispersion relation. So each of these dispersion relations correspond to the rod of that given height. So now when a wave travels through the, um, the material, it now experiences dispersion properties depending on the rod where it's at because we've changed it so gradually. So this structure is then unsurprisingly called the meta wedge because it looks like a doorstop, basically this wedge material. And it has two different effects, whether you fire waves in from the left or from the right. And this stuff was done by um, some of my collaborative collaborators sort of five or six years ago. And I really want to focus on this thing called the inverse meta wedge. So this is when we send Rayleigh waves in from the tall to short resonators and something really quite interesting happens. So I'm going to show you this um, simulation courtesy of one of my collaborators. And what this will show is two Rayleigh waves coming in at different frequencies. The waves will slow down depending on the dispersion of the rod height, which we've calculated a priori. And at different positions in the array, the rod is now, the, the wave is now no longer supported by the array, but it is supported as a free shear wave in the elastic bulk material below the rod. So what happens is we get this phenomenon called mode conversion, where we have these Rayleigh waves coming in from the right hand side. They then start interacting with our resonant rods and at different spatial positions, which corresponds to the frequency, these waves tunnel off into the bulk and these are now shear waves in the bulk. So we've converted a surface Rayleigh wave into a shear wave that's traveling in the forward direction. This now works over a much larger range of frequency because we've graded our rod height and altered the dispersion spatially. So again, if we had something we wanted to protect here like buildings or a power plant or something like this, this could potentially be used to sort of redirect ground borne vibration. So this was done in, in 2016 and has been experimentally verified since then. And so if I came into this, this topic quite late on in my PhD and thought, well, can we get this device to do anything else? Because metamaterials seem to be these dream materials that can do, do quite a lot of interesting things. So I was wondering, because this does actually still have some limitations in that it's always only into shear waves. It's always only in the forward direction and this angle doesn't seem to change. So I thought about this a little bit and asked, can we make the wave go back on itself? Because if we have a structure here, and this wave then reflects off something down here, we would still get potential vibrations that we don't want. So again, sorry to skim over so much mathematics, but without doing an undergraduate course in solid state physics, it would be quite tedious to explain. But if you take some more concepts from solid state physics, you can actually cause this wave to flip back on itself. So I'll just hopefully convince you that of that with another time domain simulation. So here we have a Rayleigh wave coming in from the left hand this side and we have our graded array of rods and we've tuned the dispersion and their resonance such as that we get this effect and what we're doing is that we're ramping this frequency up 
as a function of time. And just about now, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that you're able to see that this Rayleigh wave comes in and it is now flipped back on itself and is now converted to a shear wave in the opposite direction. And we choose the position that this happens based on the frequency and the dispersion that we've modeled. And actually, more interestingly than in the first case, the angle is also frequency dependent and now so is the wave type. So we've managed to separate shear from compression using this dispersion. So as this um, simulation goes on, you'll see that the wavelength of the converted wave in the opposite direction starts to change. And I'll hopefully be able to convince you of that with some snapshots. So this now has it on it, the, the stream plots of the, the solid displacement within the bulk. And you see that this is very clearly a shear wave that's, that's um, the particle motion is, is transverse to the direction of propagation. And now at a higher frequency, you see that we now have longitudinal waves or compressional waves in the bulk. So this we thought looks very nice and seems to work and it matches the theory. So we went to our colleagues in Nottingham who are in the um, ultrasonics department there and we asked very politely if they would build this for us. So our elastic half space now is a slab of aluminium and they have 3D printed on our, um, our metal wedge. And you see that these are rods of increasing height. And what we wanted to do was measure the top and the bottom surface of this slab because we can't actually see what's going on inside the slab. But if this works, we'll be able to excite a Rayleigh wave on the top and then because of the, the coupling between compression and shear to Rayleigh waves on the bottom surface, we should be able to see a Rayleigh wave going in the opposite direction at the position that we've predicted it if this has all worked. So I'll show you some experimental results of that now. So this is the actual filtered experimental field. So you'll see a Rayleigh wave on the top surface. And then after this red line is where we introduce our meta wedge. And at a given position where we predict, we'll start to see the, the amplitude decay and then magic, as if by magic on the bottom surface, we'll then see a Rayleigh wave go in the opposite direction. So hopefully this will play. Yes. So here's our Rayleigh wave. It now gets into our meta wedge and is slowed down. You see there's some conversion happening and then you see this Rayleigh wave trundling along, along the bottom surface in the other direction. And the amplitude of the, the waves that then get through the devices is massively reduced. So that we know that that's converted into a shear wave because of the angle and the the, the wavelength of the Rayleigh wave on the bottom surface. And to view the p-conversion, you see the same thing just at a higher frequency. So these are all megahertz frequency because this is scaled down to the ultrasonics version in the lab. So again, you see some conversion, the wave trundles on into the bulk and then excites a Rayleigh wave on the bottom surface. So that was the actual experimental results that um, the group of Matt Clark gave us from, from Nottingham. Um, so because I love making movies and visualizing things, I've done the same thing so this again is the actual experimental data. I've just bunged it into Blender as a texture map. And so you actually get this sort of 3D perspective of it now. And um, so here again, you see the Rayleigh wave, you sort of see it clearly on this top surface here. It then gets to the positions of the rods, something happens in the bulk, and then you see this wave wiggling back on itself along the bottom surface. So hopefully I've managed to convince you that without much mathematics, um, if you get these dispersion relations and you, and you know how to interpret them, you can, you can engineer a lot of different effects. So there's a variety of other different effects um, that the meta wedge can do. One is called rainbow trapping, but I've, I've sort of not focused on that um, just now. So this meta wedge hopefully is um, going to take off and actually in a big way, and I mean big in terms of scale, because as I mentioned earlier, Seismic waves are, are a potential application of controlling ground-borne vibration. And there's quite an active uh, group in France um, who are part of this thing called, well, it's a multi-national uh, collaboration, this thing called the Metaphore project. And what it is, is that rather than having a slab of metal as your elastic half space, what if you had the surface of the earth as your elastic half space? And rather than having little rods or pins, what if you use trees? So because trees are just like big rods, basically. They can resonate up and down and left and right and all sorts. And so people have actually done this and measured the resonances of trees and seen, can you actually use this to control elastic waves in your subsurface soil? And there's this like weirdly periodic forest on the edge of Grenoble where they've managed to actually um, calculate the dispersion relations for, for a periodic forest pretty much. So um, all these red dots here are I think a thousand hydrophone uh, oh, velocimeters, sorry, that measure 
vibrations in the ground. And these, ble these um, blue points here, these are sources where they essentially punch the ground really hard and create a seismic wave. And they've managed to verify band gap effects and all these sorts of things in this natural metamaterial where uh, they use this for. So this is the sort of thing that people are hoping you might be able to do with pre-planted forests if you have a Rayleigh wave could the trees actually act as these resonators and redirect it and protect things behind it? Um, so I hope that wasn't too left field, especially for the first talk of the day. Thank you for putting me here because I have a summer school this afternoon. So um, I'm very aware that it was super light on the maths, but hopefully I've been able to convince you that metamaterials in general, and that there's a huge variety of, of these structures. The ones I've shown you are sort of like a, a very, very small subset of what a metamaterial can do. But hopefully I've convinced you that once you have the dispersion relation, you, in my opinion, you have everything. So that's that's really all you need. And they have lots of other applications. Um, this is another one of our recent works where we, we actually looked at how much energy you could extract from, from surface waves and beams using these graded um, meta structures. And also you can imagine if you had two meta wedges on either side of a source, then perhaps you could focus some elastic waves in, in some ways, some sort of elastic lens or something like that. So. Uh, I hope that was okay, and um, thank you very much for listening, especially this early on a, on a, a nice summer's day, and uh, I'd be delighted to take any questions you've got. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. That was really interesting. Uh, do we have any questions for Greg? I see some people are clapping, so I'm clapping on their behalf. <laughs> Okay, uh, Erin has a question. Erin, do you want to put it in the chat or shall we unmute you? Let's see. Okay, I think you can unmute yourself. Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, um, so you bring up the example of the forest behaving as a metasurface. It got me thinking, are there any other examples in nature where things just uh, happen to behave naturally as a metasurface and happen to naturally protect the ecosystem in other ways from natural disasters without without any human interference? Um, that's a great question. Um, in terms of protection, um, I'm not entirely sure, um, but there is, so there, there is this there's a very purist definition of what a metamaterial is, and it's much, much more defined than what I gave. I sort of view them as things that control waves in interesting ways that the waves wouldn't be controlled that unless that was there. And a lot of people attach man-made to that. But there's this other effect that the meta wedge does, this rainbow trapping thing, which I've briefly mentioned. Some, some people argue that that's actually how the cochlea works as well. So, um, the little hairs that sense and um, the vibrations in the membrane in the cochlea to pick up sound, that change it into electric signal. These hairs change length pretty much as a function of distance as they wrap around the cochlea. And what that does is that means that different frequencies are selected at different positions in your ear. Um, so there's this argument that maybe the cochlea is a, a bio metamaterial. And there's a lot of people that are looking into sort of hierarchical bio-inspired metamaterials, um, but not really for the purpose of protection. Um, it turns out that, that when you look at um, metamaterial response in terms of the resonance, some cities actually kind of, so this is not natural obviously, but buildings, the way that some of them resonate actually protects other buildings. And I don't think that was really meant at the time, but that's because you, in cities, you essentially have a cluster of resonators. So your buildings are now your rods. And when they resonate at different frequencies, different wave interactions happen between the buildings. So I think to answer your question, probably not in terms of protection, but I think that is hopefully what um, sort of direction that people will be going in. I guess it works for all wave systems, basically. So there's also people looking at water waves and water waves coming up to coastlines. So can something, can you do something with the coastline to make it sort of naturalish to prevent tsunamis or something like that? So, so long story short, probably not, but uh, thanks for the question. I hope that answered it. 
Thank you very much. I think Erin is satisfied. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions? Perhaps I can ask a question while people are thinking. Please, um, yeah. So again, about the, the metaphorist, the metaphore. <laughs> so yeah. um, what happens in terms of non-homogeneities, right? So you're talking about the ground as an elastic surface and then the trees, yeah. so different heights, different volumes. Yeah. How do you model this? It then gets very complicated. Um, so actually, the, the guys that do the metaphor A stuff, um, it's led by a chap called Philip Rue, and he's actually a geophysicist. So a lot of them, there's, they're, I think this is maybe the second or third year of the project. And initially, it was to, to show that it can work. And now they are doing all the hardcore stuff. Because obviously, the rods, the rods in our aluminium block are 3D printed on. So the bonding between them is, is pretty much perfect. Or they used to be milled actually as well. So there was no glue or anything to, to screw it up. But trees obviously have horrific root systems. There's then different layers of soil that interact different ways. So in terms of the modeling, I think you ask a geophysicist to do it very, very nicely with a, a big old computer. Um, so I haven't actually done much in, in terms of that, that side of things. I just looked at the sort of fundamental physics of can you redirect the waves given these these resonant interactions and then you hope that the trees behave themselves i guess okay <laughs> okay thank you so it's, it's, it gets really complicated yeah i bet <laughs> uh any other questions from our audience okay perhaps i can ask another one <laughs> go for it so yeah, sure <laughs> In uh, this configuration that you had with uh, the roads, right? So the, the original experiment that you described, so everything looked to be not just periodic, but highly symmetric as well. So you were uh, using roads of the same shape? Yes, yeah. So same uh, height, same diameter. Same diameter, different same heights, same spacing. Um, so that, that helps the interpretation in terms of the language of periodic materials. And it makes calculating dispersion relations really easy if you have. So the dispersion relations we calculate are actually for an infinite array of rods for one height. Right. And then you change it very, very slowly so that when the wave gets to that given height, the next nearest interactions, it doesn't really notice the change in height. So it thinks it's in an infinitely periodic array of that given height at that position. If you were to do it for the structure as a whole, um, it still works. You can actually introduce some randomness in it because this is essentially a resonant phenomena. So the wave actually only really strongly interacts with the rod that it's at. So there have been other uh, studies sort of that predated the meta wedge by Andrea um, and Richard that looked at random arrays of rods and you get the same sort of band gap phenomenon, but it's now not as so neatly described in terms of the language of periodic materials. So it's it's a, it's a it's a bit of a trick. It's a really convenient way to represent all this stuff, and um, but really what you care about is just making the rods resonate. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Thank you very much. No problem at all. My pleasure. <laughs>